Hey, welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 833-999-1877 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. Hey, this is Brian Alzate, and this is Hell Has an Exit. Today, I have my good friend, Garen James. Hi. What's up, dude? How are you? What's going on? I just want to say I love you. I appreciate you so much. Every time I see you, I always feel like this feeling of debt. Like, I know what you've done in my life and a lot of other people's life. You were one of the first people I've ever seen that was, like, super successful going to meetings and like making the coffee, you know, and like volunteering at the clubhouse. And that always like stood out to me because it was like, wow, like here's this guy who could be anywhere right now. And he's in the hood handing out waters and hot dogs, you know? Yeah. One of my favorite stories with you is that you were my grand sponsor when I first got clean. Yes. My sponsor at the time, the Mad Russian, used to always tell me about you. He'd be like, oh, bro, this guy, he does this, and he's the man, and he taught me everything I know, and you got to meet him one day. And I remember I had, and I was thinking, like, you were like some, like, I just didn't imagine you, right? And I was just thinking, like, some hardcore drug addict. He's like, oh, bro, he taught me this, and he taught me that, and he used to tell me, like, if you do this, you're going to get high. When I finally met you, I'll never forget, like, we were speaking at, like, some county facility. Yeah. You pulled up, I think, in a... I think like a white Maserati or something. Like I forgot what car. It was. I think it was a, a black Maserati. Black yeah, Maserati. Yeah. You had like white jeans on, you know. And I remember you came out the car, probably wearing like Ed Hardy or something. And I remember I being like, "This is the guy, right? You know, this is the guy that my sponsor's been telling me about. He doesn't look like a yeah, drug like, addict, bro. This, this is the because my sponsor was so hardcore and screaming and yelling and talking about like the diseases out doing push-ups and he's gonna knock you out. You got to keep your hands up. Here comes you know you and i'm just like this is the guy that taught him everything and i'll never forget <laughs> being there i was probably a couple months clean because our clean dates are close to each other yeah and i remember being a couple months clean and you stood up and you shared your story and it was captivating you're an incredible storyteller i remember you screaming and saying lock the doors lock the doors, lock the doors. Yeah. we're gonna find <laughs> out yeah and i remember just like listening to this story about like crack addiction and like your mom and with the plexiglass and i'll never forget at the end of it you said like you could do anything and you can be anything mm -hmm. until today like when i think about like when people ask me about like being successful or anything like that like i i still think about that all the time that's yeah that was one of my main selling points because selling points for recovery like you need a selling point but <laughs> but, but you kind of do because it's like you that's have, your job when you're young and there's other people coming in the rooms and they think it's corny you have to try to convince them that it's not in a way that is going to benefit them you know yeah the biggest rush for me, and I think where I sort of got that sort of rundown about, it's like you tell your story about the depths of, of how low you were, and mm -hmm. then just let everyone know, no matter what, no matter how low you get, like you can come out of that. Mm -hmm. You can, because the desperation, I remember laying on the floor of the Broward County Jail, thinking I'll always be a hopeless, helpless drug addict. I will always be, and I accepted that, mm -hmm. and I hated myself, truly hated myself. And then to just get that love from everyone and get somewhere and just try to convince someone else, like, mm -hmm. you can get somewhere too. I really got all that when I first spoke back at a Department of Corrections run treatment center. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there with the 80 men, and I'm looking at them, and I just remember that spiritual awakening sitting there. It was, I, I don't know, people talk about spiritual awakenings mm -hmm. and they talk about, uh, I don't know, like you're on a mountain somewhere mm -hmm. and you just, you think of someone with their legs crossed and floating. Yeah, I, you can I, give it like a meditative state yes, or something. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But for me, my, my spiritual awakenings are always in the dingiest mm -hmm. places <laughs> at this Department of Corrections run treatment center just sitting there and just feeling that gratitude of, wow, I kind of, I, I made it. Mm -hmm. And being able to 
project that onto everyone else. I have seven felony convictions. I have dual diagnosed. At one point, I told a therapist I should be on disability. To get past all that, it's something that you have to share with people. Like you want, you want to just were grab you, them. Were you like this though? Because I have a lot of friends who who are so shameful about talking about their addiction and like maybe like how they grew up or when they get clean, they just don't want to tell people they're addicts. They don't want to talk about how they used to smoke crack. They kind of like, mm -hmm. they're shy about it. You know, they just don't want people to know they're insecure about it. They don't want to tell everybody. And like, not everyone's okay with telling people their story. You know, when you right. first meet them, I think in the beginning it flips. Well, there's a, a difference in audience. Obviously, I ran a business that I was on a bunch of talk shows, Dr. Phil mm -hmm. 2020, Nightline News. And for many years, I kept that under wraps. Mm -hmm. Later on, uh, after we had this very successful TV show, The Gigolo Show on Showtime, I said to myself, I want to do a story. And I contacted my publicist mm -hmm. and said, it's recovery month coming up. Can we do something? And we ended up doing a whole article about being in recovery mm. as a business owner and things like that. And I sort of like broke the mold at that point, said I was in a 12-step program and things like that. But for a long time, publicly, I just didn't share anything like that. Mm -hmm. But when I get into a room full of other addicts, I'll just let it rip, all rip. Yeah, yeah. It's all different. rip, mm -hmm. yeah. For me, I kind of was just like, look, this is who I am. And it kind of was a safeguard for me because like if I was telling people I was in recovery, I couldn't like sneak a beer one day and be like, well, guess what? I'm not today, you know? <laughs> so it's like when I told someone up front, I was like setting a flag that like, this is what I am yeah. and this is what I'm working towards. So like if I'm having a down day, like I might be struggling. Like, and like mm -hmm. in, my, in my early recovery, like I walked into high school and like stood up first day of school and they said, introduce yourself. And I was like, hey, I'm Brian, I'm an addict, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you know, I was telling people because I was scared of not having the accountability. And I think as I got older, I wouldn't tell people until I had proven myself in whatever industry or vertical I was in because I didn't want to get judged off that. Well, even today, if I'm at a restaurant and mm -hmm. my wife is not in the program and she gets a glass of wine, mm -hmm. the, the, and for you, sir, <laughs> I'll just say I'm driving tonight. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason You'd that you— like, oh, I used every, to be a homeless drug you, addict. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's Some no— people do that. Yeah. yeah. There's no reason to mm -hmm. just spew that all over the community. Mm -hmm. If you truly are trying to get comfortable with coworkers and things mm -hmm. like that, like I think it's okay to say. Yeah. I think it's okay to say I'm in recovery. But then again, you don't want to talk about removing the toilet thinking <laughs> the crack stem is still in the, <laughs> the, in the, in the P trap. Yeah. yeah. So there's certain things that you don't go go Blaine for. Leads. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes years to kind of learn that because a lot of times I would like overshare you know, mm -hmm. overshare or something like that. Or I'll go on like four or five dates with a girl and like not bring it up until later because right. it's like, it's an intimate part of you that like isn't for everybody, you know? I agree. I agree. So let's get into your story. Yeah. Where are you, where are you from? <laughs> I grew up in South Florida. Mm -hmm. Went to college. That explains all of it. Yeah, I grew up in, <clears throat> I grew up in Boca Raton. Okay. Uh, went to college in Indiana. I grew up with a father who was an alcoholic. Mm. So that was something that I always said is, I'm never going to be like him. And when I was in college, I was in a fraternity, and they did a lot of drinking, and I always kind of was cautioned about it. One day, this guy said, I've got this pill. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take it? And it kind of just gives you a little energy. And I, <laughs> sure. And I ended up taking this pill. He was a, a narcoleptic. Mm. which is one of the rarest mental disorders out there, you know, narcolepsy. Nobody has it, but mm -hmm. this kid did. And he was prescribed Ritalin. Oh, really? <clears throat> okay. It's yeah. cousin. It's cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Crystal meth, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it that is. Yeah. And I took that pill and it was like, wow, I feel really good. I, I hate it when people say I just felt different, but I, I really did. Like, yeah. I felt different around people, and then, like, I could actually felt like I could be more myself or something because there was always something hidden inside mm -hmm. me. Maybe it's just the addiction that just kind of tricked me into thinking this is great for you. Mm -hmm. And I went back to him. Can I get another one, like, the next few days? And he was like, here, here's a few. And then I went back, and he's like, listen, you know, I'm, I'm basically going to 
fall asleep walking. <laughs> I only get a certain amount of these mm-hmm. per day. So no, I can't give you any more. So <laughs> I'm in college and I go to the computer lab. This is back before mm-hmm. we all had cell phones, on laptops computers. and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm in the computer lab and I'm searching, what is Ritalin given for? Mm-hmm. And, oh, narcoleptic, I don't know. And oh, ADHD. Hmm, what's that? And oh, okay. So I remember I printed out the list of, of symptoms. Reverse engineering. Yeah. Printed the symptoms, studied that. Studied, 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 and made an appointment with the school's uh, psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. And I walked in and I said, uh, hello, sir. My doctor back home, we <laughs> decided for my senior year that I would try to get off uh, my prescription of Ritalin because of ADHD and that I'm diagnosed. And, you know, symptom A, B, C, and D is really flaring lately. And I really, I called the, him and he said to just check in with you and, you know, get, just get back on it for the remainder of this semester. And the guy looked at me and wrote a prescription. Mm-hmm. I think that was the start of it all. You know, that was the start of it all. I remember going to the this little pharmacy in Indiana, and there was this older gentleman, mm-hmm. and he was like, you can have a seat while I count this out. And I said, <laughs> no, sir. And I just remembered watching him count those pills out with this metal spatula, and it was... He was counting them, and I was counting them with him. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight. And it, I don't know. It was just mm-hmm. just like something, you know, and the spatula just looks so beautiful with against those white pills. And I was in love. Mm. Getting that bottle of pills was better than any Christmas that I had ever had. Mm. Um, that feeling. That was the start of it all. I came back home. I ended up running through that bottle and finding out who else is ADD, ADHD <laughs> on campus and went back to the psychiatrist. And he's like, well, we should check in with your doctor. Did you get the, can you have him call? And I'm like, yeah, I'll have him give you a call. And so it was a short romantic love affair. Mm-hmm. And then I came home from college and got a corporate job. It was just like a little fling that I had. When I came here, there was no psychiatrist I could trick really or you know while I'm not in school ADHD or anything like that and and it kind of was just over with Hmm. I was at a party and someone had some cocaine I remember thinking it's got to be like that Ritalin stuff Hmm. he gave me a little and the same thing happened I went and I said, well, where do you get it? <laughs> did, you know, you I'm, in the, the I'm in the computer yeah. lab, basically. <laughs> Back in the computer lab, where mm-hmm. did you get it? And he's like, oh, this guy in the hood, you mm-hmm. know, we're almost out. Shouldn't we go get more? Like, mm-hmm. I'll drive. I want to meet the guy. Mm-hmm. I didn't say all that, but I wanted to, to meet the guy. Mm-hmm. And we just drove through. And I remember the guy's name is Earl. I'll never forget the guy's name, <laughs> Earl. And <laughs> we went through and he bought the little whatever, and and I said, uh, I'm Garen. I'll <laughs> I'm gonna, be. I'm gonna uh, need your number. I can swing back by. Yeah. Is that fine? You know. And he's like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. from there, it just it just went down, down and it hill. just never really stopped. Uh, I had a few things here and there, and this disease is so cunning, baffling, tricky. Uh, when I went into my first treatment center. At that time, I was just doing cocaine, and, and they were like, you know, this is a program of abstinence from all drugs. Mm. And I, could, I couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand that because I used to drive up to Midway Road mm-hmm. and, and uh, go off into the farm fields and pick shrooms and eat them right out of the, out yeah. of the cow patties. And I was like— Especially today, it's like everyone's on shrooms everyone. and ayahuasca and all sorts of things. Well, yeah. This is, you know, this was a while, mm-hmm. while ago, but still I just couldn't understand the concept that I, like, I wasn't allowed to ever have a, a shroom again. Mm-hmm. And it was so peaceful and fun. There was no mm-hmm. obsessive, compulsive, spend all your money and craziness. And It seems real over the top when you're like, well, I only have a problem with this substance. Yes. Why are you going after all these innocent substances? <laughs> yeah. It would be like going to somebody who's like, hey, you know, you're eating a lot of sweets. We're going to have to get rid of all the food. All the food. What do you mean? Yeah, even water. You know, like <laughs> it, it feels like that. It's like, what do you mean? How am I supposed to live? I can't smoke weed. I can't even drink a little bit. Right. I know I have a problem with this cocaine. Right. It seems absurd and it doesn't make sense. And But every single addict has that hurdle. I think every so. Every single person struggles with 
what do you mean complete abstinence? What right. do you mean even drugs I don't have a problem with I can't right, do? Right, right, I remember thinking like I've only done crystal meth like once or twice by accident. I thought it was like cocaine or something. Right. But I remember thinking like not even crystal meth. Right. Like I don't have a problem with it, right. but I still would like to do it sometimes. You know, going back to mushrooms is so funny is recently – like I'm on the Apple News or something mm-hmm. like that. And, and, and talk about it. And there's this big article about how it's really beneficial to PTSD mm-hmm. and it's beneficial to everything. And right. I, I was laying there and I was like, man, I wonder if I should try microdose. And it mm-hmm. sounds like it's so beneficial. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> you know, this is with 14 years clean. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, there's always something inside my head that's going to try to wiggle its way in to convince me mm-hmm. that I should do some drugs. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. And even people who aren't in the program who respect your recovery and think you're doing great will tell you like, hey, you could do mushrooms. I mean, it would help your addiction more. Right. Maybe you wouldn't have to go to so many meetings anymore. Maybe right. you wouldn't have to even do anything. This could be it. This could be it. So where. I wouldn't have to go to meetings. I can just microdose and like my, my life is, is beautiful. Like, so you're telling me that if I do enough mushrooms, I can smoke crack. <laughs> like that's literally what I think is like, so then I won't be an addict. Right. I remember my sister had surgery and she was taking these painkillers. And I was like, well, like how many did you get? She's like, I don't know. I didn't even, I was like, what, like what, what milligram? What, do you like, not know? Yeah. Did you not look at it? She's like, well, I don't, I don't want them. And I was like, if I wasn't an addict, I would have taken them all. And she goes, that's why you're an addict. Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, right. if I was an addict, I'd be doing them. And she's like, well, that's why you are. I even shared in a meeting because it was getting, it was kind of starting to get to me. Yeah, you kept thinking about it. Kept thinking about, I should try this microdose thing. Mm-hmm. It's being prescribed. It's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. I mean, I used to love it's, mushrooms. It's the newest wave. Maybe instead of doing a depressive medication, I could just do a little microdosing. Right. Because yeah. that's what they do. They're, which... It's like instead of Prozac, now you could take these micro mushrooms right. that are such a minuscule amount. It's right. It's not even really mushrooms. Right, right, right. You know? right. And you're just like, well, people take meds. I just rem- I just know, I just know that I'd get these micro doses and mm-hmm. I just wouldn't f- I I'd break that barrier of being I'd, clean. I break the barrier of being clean. I'd take the one, I wouldn't feel it enough. And I would take another mm-hmm. and another. And, and then I would take, you know, if there's a kit of 50 micro doses, mm-hmm. I would take them all. Yeah. And that's that, my uh, thing is that I never took a sleep medication. I know a lot of people do, but I was always like, what if I take one and I have a bad day? And I'm like, I'm just going to take a whole bunch today. And just because take a nap. Yeah. I do. I don't even have, I don't have, if you go to my fridge, I have no snacks because I <laughs> eat them all. <laughs> I can't even control my, sometimes I go to my friend's house who has kids, who have kids and they have Oreo. Like, right. you don't wake up in the middle of the night, just eat these all. And, this, and a lot of them are like, we do, you know, right. but it's like, there's something in me that I have this weak, I don't know if it's like a weakness, but there's something in me that just says, just do it all. Just do yeah. all of them. Just just overeat, you yeah. know? For me, it's like, I feel like God, the universe has given me the second chance and I need to be grateful. And for me to not be grateful and try something else or to ruin what I have going for me is not worth the risk. Even if it's a 0.001%. Let's right, say right. if you microdose, you might relapse 0.0001%. It's not even worth it to me. It's like, what am I looking for? Like, what am I looking for? Really, you're just looking to get high. Yeah, I'm looking to get high. (laughs) Like, what can I not accomplish? And I struggle with this too, because ayahuasca, I was listening to the Mike Tyson thing. He's talking about ayahuasca, DMT. And I've done so much psychedelics as a kid. You know, the last time I did LSD, I actually got tasered by the cops. So I probably shouldn't be doing LSD or or psychedelics. But it kept coming up, I having this feeling. And I talked to my friend who she's in a, a different fellowship, but she's sober. And she had been like a hippie, her whole active addiction. So she really knows about psychedelics. Like right. she's probably done DMT more times than I smoke crack. And I remember I was asking her like, hey, look, I'm thinking about doing psychedelics. Do you struggle with wanting to do psychedelics in like a healing way? Right. Since you've been sober all these years? She goes, absolutely not. That stuff just gets you high. It just fucks you up. Right. I was like, when you did DMT, did you think it was like a spiritual thing? She was like, no. Right. She was like working the steps, being clean, connecting with my family, prayer and meditation, yoga, 
She's like, those are the things that saved my life. Right. I've done DMT a thousand times. Right. And I'm not trying to like shit on people's beliefs because some people, it like, it's a life changer for them. Right. I just know for me, man, I've gotten way more than I ever expected out of recovery. Yeah. It's like those, you know, talking about those microdosing things like that. It's what it would do for me is make me become a liar. Mm -hmm. I'd be going to meetings and be lying and preaching about and preaching and recover yeah. and and that's what keeps me clean that connection mm -hmm. that I can walk into somewhere and feel like I'm a part of and that I'm being completely honest with these people here in this mm -hmm. program if I do that if I break that I've lost my only thing that's ever worked for me <laughs> the only thing that's ever worked for me mm -hmm. over me being curious yeah and I think that, yeah, I think most relapses lead with like, hey, I'm, I'm, I don't want to ruin my life. I'm just a little curious on right. what, what this is. It's, and you know what? Like uh, in early recovery, there was like uh, times where I was thinking about doing like really soft drugs, like, you know, almost like mushrooms and stuff like that. And I remember my sponsor being like, yeah, kind of like when you did marijuana. Mm -hmm. It's the most natural drug there is. Everybody smokes weed. And you got addicted to it. Scientifically, it's not even addicting. <laughs> right. It's like they've done studies that you can't get addicted to it. Right. And you smoked it every single day until you found another harder drug. Right. So you're able to get addicted to things that aren't necessarily addicting. Marijuana wasn't in it. And marijuana is normally an innocent thing for most people. Right. And for addicts, even with marijuana, we become dysfunctional. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I think people struggle with two things. I think they struggle with the complete abstinence part. And then I think they struggle with the, like the uncoolness of 12 step meetings. Oh, I think, yeah. I know, I know I used to talk about that, but it's like, you're young, people are going to nightclubs and, you know, whatever. And then you go to meetings and people are like, you know, we're going bowling. Yeah, you're going yeah, with people yeah. like, you know, double your age. Yeah. It's so funny. I remember the first time I got brought to a recovery meeting. This was back when I was in total denial. I was in a treatment center and they were trying to tell me, yeah, I couldn't do mushrooms ever again. Back to the <laughs> mushrooms, always back to the mushrooms, always back to them. But uh, they put me on the, on the drug buggy. Mm -hmm. I went to treatment in Boca after I'd been to college and now I'm back into this treatment center in Boca. And I went to Boca, I went to Boca Middle, I mm -hmm. went to Boca High. This is your hometown. Hometown. And yeah. I'm, most people go away to treatment, you know? Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, I, I remember they put us on the drug buggy, the handicap van. I, mm -hmm. I, I looked at it. Oh my God, I'm on a handicap van. Mm -hmm. What has my life come to? And I slid in the middle and they brought us to this place in Delray called the Crossroads Club, mm -hmm. which is not the one that's current, but there's a the one before that. Mm -hmm. Got off the van, and there's a bunch of people outside smoking. I looked over, and I saw a guy, and he had a T-shirt, and it said, like, a 12-step picnic. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> that guy walks around town saying... He's in a 12-step program. I, goes to Publix. God, can I get a sub? <laughs> By the way, I'm a complete failure. I failed using drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. I'm in this 12-step program. We had a picnic. <laughs> like, yeah. I could not believe that they had T-shirts for this thing. Mm -hmm. You're going to really walk around. Promote that you're an addict. Promote and, that and you're a, a, more, no, a a back up. then a, a failure. Yeah. A failure because you got to remember that prior to me becoming an addict mm -hmm. if someone is an addict that i never had the concept that they that there was a mm -hmm. disease so really they were just failures mm -hmm. it's almost like somebody with a t-shirt that says i have 15 felonies correct it, yeah it, right it, yeah it feels the same thing like you're proud of that you're right. proud of have all these felonies right i'm not to say that you know Maybe you shouldn't have felonies and, you know, things happen, but you're going to wear a T-shirt that says you have 20 felonies? Right. You might want to keep that to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. yeah. So so at the time when I just didn't any, understand anything about addiction, that was mm -hmm. one of the first things that I just could not believe those people did. Anyway, I ended up getting into, into recovery and I ended up, I was working at an art gallery and I went to a, like an area service meeting mm -hmm. and my sponsor sponsor was doing the area convention mm -hmm. and he was the, the 
president. He hated mm-hmm. when I called him the president. <laughs> there is no presidents. He was the chairperson for the committee. Mm-hmm. He said, you work in an art gallery. Why don't you become the arts and graphics chair for Even our area two totally different convention? <laughs> I'm like, man, I, I sell art. I can't make it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On a computer. <laughs> uh, yeah, what are you talking about? But he was my sponsor's sponsor. Mm-hmm. And I looked at my sponsor and he said, he just he gave me the nod. And I was like, yes, of course I'll be the arts and graphics chair. Mm-hmm. Looking for more ways to save this spring? HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. With so much variety, there are options for everyone and every lifestyle. No worries if you're not a pro in the kitchen. HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. After a long day of work, HelloFresh is what you need. Use HelloFresh.com slash Exit50 and use code Exit50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com slash Exit50 and use code Exit50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. America's number one meal kit. I started doing it and they're like, make a flyer. And I was like, oh shit, I got to learn how to make a flyer. And then I made a flyer. And then, mm-hmm. okay, now you have to make uh the, this magnet, you have to make a design, you have to make the theme and logo. And I made this theme and logo and the merchandise committee got it. And so the day of the convention comes and I'm walking around the convention and I walk in to the room, they're selling the t-shirts. That you made. Yeah. I remember I said to the lady, how are the t-shirts selling? <laughs> and she said, they're selling really good. We're almost sold out. Mm. I get Mm -hmm. a little um, emotional over that, over that, because that was one of my spiritual spiritual awakening moments too. Like Mm -hmm. we have these weird points in our lives where everything kind of just comes into a circle. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing in that room, making fun of the guy that was wearing the T-shirt, and here I was. I ended up designing a T-shirt for this program that changed and saved my life and i bought one of the shirts <laughs> and i wore it occasionally yeah <laughs> i don't, I don't mm-hmm. i'm still not a big t-shirt wearer yeah those types of things that mm-hmm. those types of moments for me is just so special in this recovery and the thing is so like when people get clean they don't understand why you need to go to meetings Dude, the meetings is like the beginning of it. Right. There's conventions and service committees. And like, if you never did service, you wouldn't have had that experience. And it's like service is so broad. You think it's like making the coffee. There's so many things you can do and so many experiences. Yeah. And it's like staying clean. You're not having that experience. There's so many things you need to do. And it's like an active addiction. There is times where my mom was crying and I felt nothing. Nothing. Didn't feel anything. I was like, dude, give me the 20 bucks. Like yeah. there was times where we become sociopaths in our in our active addiction. We don't have the feelings. We don't have the ability to feel empathy. Mm-hmm. And you would think that normal life would just, you know, feelings would just come back, but they don't. And it's like when I started to do service and put myself in these scenarios, I started to have connections really deep over some of the most minute it could be someone buying me a sandwich yeah that i would cry about you know and it's like you start to unravel your feelings again and it's not going to happen just by being clean no talking about service so i always did h mm-hmm. and i and for anyone that doesn't know you bring a meeting into a hospital jail. institution jail yeah. so be, i had so many felonies seven felonies so every year i would apply to go into jail. That was always my goal. Mm. I, I would go into treatment centers and this and that, but I always felt like I'm pretty loud. I'm pretty captivating. Maybe that's the word. You're I don't like, yeah, yeah, I just feel I, like jail's a good place for me because I'm mm-hmm. not so meek that I would be boring them. We do good in jails. Yes. Yeah. So, so for people that don't know, like when you go speak at a jail, you have two minutes to win them over. Or, or you got to go in there and bring it. These are people screaming, go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. These are people that are like, we don't want to fucking hear mm-hmm. it. You ask them to the, do the readings. They're like, you read it. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. In, in jail, you got to remember that it's not a treatment center. They're and not there to get help. They're yeah. there because they got arrested. Mm-hmm. So you have to bring this magic right away. Yeah. Yeah. And hope hope that one of them that's sitting there that got arrested, mm-hmm. let them know like there's another way. 
And th that's when like, it really is selling because it's like, you got to think about that one guy in there mm -hmm. who's so turned off to the program. Yes. He d he's more of a criminal than an addict in his mind. He doesn't even think he has a problem. He took a left turn and, yeah. and didn't turn on his turn signal uh -huh. on the damn cop. The, <laughs> the damn cop, the cop pulled him pulled over. Him over. Yep. Yeah, if it wasn't for that damn cop, mm -hmm. yeah, I wouldn't have gotten caught with the pills. And, and they're angry and they're aggressive and they're mm -hmm. in there with all this testosterone. And yeah. it's like... When I was speaking at this convention with like 300 people at uh, Clean and Free in Washington. This guy was like, hey, man, have you spoke at a convention before? You're the main speaker. And I was like, no, I haven't. And the guy's like, <laughs> you, hey. you know, I, some people bomb. He, this was the guy. You're like, you were like, bro, I spoke in the Broward <laughs> County Jail. I'll be, yeah. I'll be perfectly but fine, he right? Like, he's like, a lot of people bomb up there. A lot of good speakers can't do it. And I remember being like. Bro, like, I do the jails. Right. Because I've done H&I &I for so, uh, right. you know, we're H&I guys. Yeah. And I, hey, I owe you that forever because you made Alex that way and he made me that. I am like, I will go speak at a prison right now. Hit me up. Yeah. Like, I will speak anywhere. I'll pay my own flight. Like, I love speaking at prisons. Yeah. Because not to toot my own horn, but not a lot of people can reach those those prisoners. And when I go up yeah. there, they look at me the same way I look at you. They're like, oh, look at this kid. He yeah. probably never spent a day in jail, which I really haven't. But when I go up there, I get a round of fucking applause. Yeah. And when you get a round of applause by criminals, yes, it's better than, it's better than anything. anything. It's the best feeling ever. So, so yeah. So I was able to speak in a jail, but I was mm. never. Uh, so for year, every year you would apply and then you could either get approved to have your own meeting, or you could get denied. For hmm. six years, every year I applied. Applying. I wow. applied. Every year at the convention, because there was a person, you could sign up. All of a sudden, I get an email that mm -hmm. said, you're approved. And I go straight to the H&I committee, wow. bring my I mean, little mm -hmm. letter, where's the jail meetings? Mm -hmm. And they said, there's a Thursday at 8 p.m. C5. And I was like, I want that meeting, please. Mm -hmm. I just got approved. I have this much time. I've been in jail. I didn't even know where I was. I was like the Conte, but I didn't know. How far it was or anything. I didn't, I didn't care. even care. Mm -hmm. So I get there and I see, oh, this is the, the same jail that I was in. I was in Conte. Mm. So I go to the front desk. I go in. And the guard finally gets me, starts walking me down the hall. And he's walking me. We take the left and we walk down and he brings me to the same cell mm. that I was in for six months. Do you know the feeling that I had walking into that cell? Like, I didn't even remember the name, the numbers on the doors. You felt it. But what I mean is, like, when I applied for the meeting, mm -hmm. it was the only one open that I could get. It was like C4 or whatever. It was just a couple letters to walk down that hall and be like, wait a second. And we walk down, and he stops at the same pod that I was in for mm -hmm. six months. And I walked in there, and man, that was like such a feeling to persevere that much to try to get a jail meeting. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, just randomly getting the same cell mm -hmm. that I was in. And man, I used to bring that meeting in, and I used to fire it up. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the feeling that you get when, when they're actually happy to see you. Yeah. It's incredible. And they start to respect you and they start to like you. And yeah. it's the same people in the pod. So yeah. like there's times where like they come in and like they don't know who you are and they're skeptical and they're talking shit to yeah. you. And they're seeing like what you're going to say because they want to press your buttons. And then it comes to a point where like, man, I've like I've done a Dave M who does Conzi still. Yeah. Like I've done his meeting. When we walk in there, they're already doing the readings. By the time we get in there, the readings are done. Yeah. They got coffee waiting for us. They're asking us if we want anything. Yeah. When it's over, they're shaking everybody's hands. Yo, thank you for coming in. I don't think like we can save people, but there are some people that do H&I with so much attraction, not promotion, mm -hmm. that it makes such a difference in the way the message is carried. Well, yeah, I think I think once you get into the program, you'll find your niche. Mm -hmm. and the from, enthusiasm. Yeah, because you'll find your place because I have the convictions. Mm -hmm. So I can actually go into a jail and talk about that. Some people, if they don't have that, they don't have the confidence. The, the to credit, the to this, the to, that, yeah. then then they shouldn't be speaking at a jail meeting. Mm -hmm. Or even if you didn't go to jail, you gotta have that spark. Mm -hmm. You gotta have that. But that's what's great about this program is that there's so many different roles that we can mm -hmm. all have. And you gotta find something that that is your like some people hate speaking. Some people right. hate 
doing area service, whatever. But like when you find something, I truly believe that service is the secret to staying clean. It's like yeah. once you convicted and doing service, how you feel is like secondary to your commitment. Right. You're committed to doing these things and you couldn't even use because you're, you have to go do these things. Right. It takes out the selfishness of like, I feel like using because the other part yeah. of your brain is like, who cares, bro? You got to do the meeting tomorrow, you know? The the thing you talked about me doing coffee, for some reason... Concession stand. Yeah. Well, I was... Yeah, I used to... Don't I used to do my time mm -hmm. or donate at uh, at a real at, at clubhouse, it's but clubhouse. it's yeah, but it's you know like you said it's not in the hood. It's in the hood and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I like doing it at a specific meeting at a home group or something mm -hmm. because that means that I can't forget it as much. Mm. I do sometimes commitments like that just so I'll know that I'm going to be there 30 minutes early because I, maybe if I didn't, I'd show up a little late or maybe mm, not go or early, little, yeah. you know. So if I have a job, it, it just really helps mm -hmm. me uh, get to the meeting. And it's accountability. And it's like, I apply that in everything I do. There are times where a higher personal trainer, sometimes I'm like, dude, I'm more in shape than this guy. You know? right, right, right. But it's the accountability part. Accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say, hey, dude, I'm going to pay you 50 bucks to work me out at 530 in the morning. Well, I can't just be like, yeah, I don't really feel like it. Cause, right. It's 50, now, yeah, it's yeah. 50 bucks. And I said I would be, be there. there. Yeah. And I don't want to be the guy who cancels. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and it doesn't seem like that would make a difference, but it all adds up. I think what I've learned in uh, recovery is like the power of compounding. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, when I was using, I used to think like, well, if I litter, it doesn't matter. Oh, well, if I rip off my friend, it doesn't matter. If I do this, like all these little things, there's a little bit here, it's a little bit. And, you know, you do that for five, six years, it compounds and you yeah. end up being a piece of shit, drug addict, selfish, yeah. no one will talk to you, all these things. And it's like in recovery... You know, you do the same thing. You help someone here. Yeah. Practice some kindness over here. You do some forgiveness over there. You know, you practice some humility over here. You do some service over here. You keep going to the meetings when you don't want to go to the meetings. And all these little things add up. And yeah. before you know, you got years clean. People like you. You know, people are texting you. I think it's real important to talk about success in recovery, too. Mm. Because, again, most people think there's never going to be any more success in their life. They've done so much damage. I learned right away that recovery is number one, but you can still like chase business. You can chase mm -hmm. other things. The reason why I learned that recovery is number one is because after I was in treatment the second time, they said, go get a, a, a small job. There was a playhouse, a theater, and I went and got a job at the box Have office. Have you done theater before that? No, I hadn't done any wow. theater. It was always a dream of mine. I always wanted to do acting, but I was always afraid. I was always afraid of being bad, mm -hmm. and that was one of the fears that I had. So I went and got a job at the box office for $6 an hour, and I met some actors, and the crazy part was this guy, Charles Nelson Riley. He did a one-man show there for a month. You mm -hmm. probably don't know who he is. Charles Nelson Riley, he's rah, 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 rah. It's this old-time actor. Mm -hmm. He was on a ton of shows, and he uh, walks in. And I'm in the box office, and I'm like, hello, Charles. And he's like, are you an actor? And I was like, uh, no. And he's like, well, you should be. Mm. Meet me after my rehearsal. And he just started to talk to me. And wow. he's like, you know you want to be an actor, don't you? And I was like, yeah, I, I always wow. had that. So he ended up really teaching me a lot about acting. And then I started to go and watch the, watch the rehearsals and performances. And then finally, I, I auditioned for a show. I auditioned for this show at the Delray Beach Playhouse. It was a three-person show, and I got the part. And I ended up getting an award for mm. Best Supporting Actor for the season, wow. I mean, at this Delray Beach Playhouse. Mm -hmm. So this was when I was still in recovery, and something— Oh, and then right after, I got my first paying gig at Dave & Buster's. Mm. It was a murder mystery theater. Oh, really? It was a oh, $75 cool. performance. There you go. Boom. Okay. So now I was a professional actor. Mm. I was a paid professional actor. Something inside of me said, see, now this is why you use drugs. Mm. Because you were doing corporate stuff. You weren't happy. I weren't happy. And now mm. you finally found your passion. So now you won't want drugs or anything like that again. And maybe even that. if you did, yeah. you would be fine. Yeah, you're not going to cycle no. out of control now. No, you finally found your passion. This is a mistake that many of us make. 
because I stopped really going to meetings and things like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I got my next gig at a, at a playhouse and I was the main character. At playhouses, usually you'll have like a final rehearsal. The director at the time said, let's have an audience for this final rehearsal. Just invite whoever you want. And me, I have a big mouth. Mm. I told so everybody. many, everybody to go. Mm -hmm. I told so many people to go. And the director, the night of the performance, the director came out and said, I'm so sorry, we have to cancel this. One of our actors is not here. Mm -hmm. And the people who knew me knew, it was you. knew who it was. They that, canceled the whole thing. They had to cancel. Well, they had to postpone the whole thing. They had to find a new actor mm. to come in for that. I was the lead. This was such a uh, like a big learning thing for me because that day I was like really nervous because it was like a lead role and I was nervous about my lines. I said, you know, a little bump would really help me job. help me concentrate. And I ended up getting a little and it just, I just, I just didn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for two days, I was disappeared. You know, that was a really big lesson about even though we can follow our dreams. We have to always remember what our number one Thing sort of is. purpose mm -hmm. is, and that's to stay clean. And after, and after, a lot of times it's like yeah. the only reason why you got that job was because you were clean. So, so the clean. only reason why you were clean was because you were yeah. doing the meetings and all that stuff. Correct. So a lot of times we'll stop doing what got us there, yeah. thinking that it was us yeah. and it was the work we were doing. And after that, you know, I, I ended up thinking that that whole dream was over. Ended up going to jail and I came out of jail and I was with my sponsor one day and I was working at this art gallery and I said, Will, you know, I really want to go back and, and kind of do what, you know, do the acting because I was mm -hmm. getting some commercial work and things like that. And my sponsor says, bro, you're clean. You can do anything. That's what he said to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I went back to an agency that I had in South Beach and I said, um, hey, uh, you think I can hit some castings? And she's like, where have you been? <laughs> and I was like, ah, I was trying, you know, corporate stuff. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a moment where you don't say I was cracked out, yeah. you know, got a bunch of felonies and things like that. So, but she sent me on some auditions. Someone taught me that it's not always a lie. It's none of their fucking business. Correct. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. So I ended up booking the show Burn Notice. And I did, a, so, did a couple episodes of Burn Notice. Let me tell you something. When one of us was on Burn Notice... And the recovery community down here, everybody was like, tune in tonight. <laughs> or, man, Garen's going to be on the show tonight. Check it out. And yeah. it was like a little, I remember I watched it. It was yeah. like this little part. Yeah, it was a yeah. small part. You know? But I remember being like, yeah, that guy's in recovery. Yeah. Like, like for us, it was like, it's like when someone makes it out the hood. You know right. what I mean? It's like when someone makes it out the hood to be a rapper or something, right. you like root for them. You're like, dude, he's from our town or whatever. When someone in recovery becomes successful, the recovery community is like, we champion you guys, yeah. you know, we really cheer you guys on. And, you know, I have to tell this story, too, because I then got a part in a movie and I had to go to L.A. Mm. This was, like, really scary for me. So I was in L.A. I actually had my own trailer. I mean, it was like a mini trailer. There was, like, six little compartments. But you had your own. I had my own. And, and it had my name on the door. And mm -hmm. I went into that trailer and I called my sponsor. And I was like, I'm so scared, you know. I'm so nervous being out here because I had been, I really put myself in the center of recovery. Yeah. I think to get clean, my you, need first to build, time. you need to build a cocoon. Oh, yeah. I had a cocoon. build like a solid foundation. Yes. For a year. Minimum. At least. And it was like my first time out of the cocoon. Yes. I was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The funny thing was, is this was Kelly Osbourne's first feature film. This mm. film actually never got released because the producer, there was some problems. Okay. But, but it was, I mean, it was filmed. Okay. Um, Ed Asner's in the movie. At some point, I think it'll get released. Okay. So I, I start chatting with Kelly Osbourne on mm -hmm. set. And I was like, you know, I can probably say this because I know your brother publicly says he's in recovery. Mm -hmm. And I'm in recovery. And I don't know if you are, Kelly. But anyway, I just you know, wanted to chat with someone mm -hmm. about that. And she's like, you know, my brother will be here for lunch. Why don't you sit with us? Oh, wow. So here I am in LA and mm -hmm. I have lunch with Jack and Kelly Osborne. And Jack is talking about how he got his cake. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here talking about recovery. The point of that story is you can find recovery. Yeah. Just so you find drugs. Just like you can find drugs. It's almost the same thing. 
You know, you know, you know what I love about your. St- I know your uh, story. Uh, uh, you know, I've done your whole bit before. There's times where I've spoken at meetings. I've done, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've spoken at meetings before and said how I met you and how uh, I heard for you speak. And I'll share 30 minutes of your story. I know it. I could do it. Yeah. And I uh, remember you were talking about like you know I was in this foreign country and I didn't know how to speak yeah. the language, but I knew how to do the the thing. And you just yeah. look for the guy doing the the, yeah. the heads up. I remember. And it's almost like in recovery. It's like so. I remember. I remember being at a family get together with no drugs and it was like hundreds of people at this family thing. And I found like the one cousin who does Coke in the of bathroom, course. you know? Yeah. And I remember when I had five years clean, I was on a cruise. I didn't even know. And the girl that I was dating at the time was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I think I want to find a meeting. She was like, we're on a fucking cruise ship. <laughs> and I was like, there's got to be one. And I remember she looked at me like I had two heads. Yeah. I didn't know that there was some on a meeting, but I just knew that like, we were like, I was going to get to one. This is before Zoom, right? right, like, right. I was going to, I was going to find one drug addict and read out of the book with them or something. And I remember I looked it up. There's a church on almost every cruise ship. Yes. And every day at like happy hour, they have a, a meeting. They did. And I remember I went over there and it was me and like two other guys and we had a meeting. Yeah. And it's like, um, what you're looking for is looking for you. Yeah. So I always tell people, like, it's easy to spot a yellow car when you're thinking about yellow cars. Yeah. So it's like when I'm thinking about recovery, I'm finding recovery. When I'm thinking about drugs, hey, I'm finding drugs. And when I'm thinking about success and I'm thinking about my business or I'm thinking about, you know, growing and expanding, I'm finding opportunities because I'm thinking about right. it. When you tell yourself, nah, it's not going to happen, that's the first line of defense. Yeah. You know? That sort of thing, too, is like when I when I was going to start this crazy business, mm this TV show and the Tyra Banks show. Yeah. I remember calling my sponsor and I'm like, should I do this? Mm-hmm. And he's like, you're clean. You can do anything. And this, this character, you know, character, Garen James, that's not even real, my real name. You know, uh, Garen James mm-hmm. is, is a character that I created. And I really learned that from the people in the rooms about fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. You know, I created the character Garen James because my real name had so many felonies. Mm. So and you didn't want people looking you up. All that, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So I created a, this character because I knew who I was and I didn't want to be judged for who, who I used to be. Mm. I wore this watch on purpose. This is a fake Breitling. Oh, wow. It's a fake Breitling. Uh-huh. I remember when I was early in recovery, that fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. And I don't really care about watches. I never have. Mm-hmm. But I knew other people did. Gotcha. So that's why, you know, Garen James bought this fake Breitling. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. You know, fake mm-hmm. guy, fake name, fake watch. Um, and I still, I mean, I ended up just because I bought, I bought a real Breitling, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I still have this watch. Wow. And it still reminds You've me. You've had that since the beginning? Since the beginning. Wow. Since, since I got out of jail. Wow. And it still works. It's a great uh-huh. fake. It's like a, it was a really wow. high end one. Hey, there you go. It yeah. still works. And one time it broke and I took it to the jeweler yeah, and he fixed. even fixed it for me. Wow. The point in that story was, you know, fake it till you make it. So when I bought, when I started the treatment center, I was making six figures doing motorcycles. Uh, the treatment center took like nine months to open. I was supposed to be working during those nine months because the new company who bought it was going to use me to buy motorcycles for them. And they kept telling me like next month we're going to start buying. And then they just kept dragging their feet and I started spending my savings. And by the time yeah. we opened the treatment center, I had spent all my savings. And the treatment center wasn't going to make money for probably like seven to eight months. So I begged my business partners like, hey, look, can I get like five grand a month? Right. And they were like, I don't know. You know, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? You know? So they were like, okay, we'll give you. So I used to write myself a check for five grand a month. And I was used to making triple that. Right. But, you know, this is another thing with business where it's like sometimes to start something new, you need to take less right. for the chance of making a lot more. And I remember I had this truck that I had some equity in, but I needed some of that money. So I sold the truck and I needed someone that like looked like a treatment center owner. Right. And I, I was looking at this uh, Mercedes CLS and all the CLSs were out of my price range, but I really liked that car and I wanted, I wanted to look like a business person, Correct. you know, and I ended up buying this CLS with 100,000 miles. Now, I would never suggest to buy a car with 100,000 miles, but I had bought probably 3,000 motorcycles at the time. I probably bought like seven, eight, ten cars at the time. I went to go look at this car, and I was only searching for cars with 40,000 miles or less because right. after 40,000 miles, I mean, good luck. Yeah. Just happened to see this one with 100,000 miles, and it was like the other ones were 45 grand. This one was like 23 grand. Right. So I said, I'll, I'll take a look at it. 
It was in better condition than all the other ones with 40,000 miles. It just looked clean. Right. I opened the glove compartment. There was a receipt for the 100,000 mile service the lady had just done. Right. I pressed the memory seat. It went all the way up front. So I knew it was an old lady. I had her name and number. So I remember I copy and pasted it into my phone. I called her. I said, hey, I'm looking at your car. She's like, who is this? That I'm like, I'm in Florida. I see you have a New Jersey number. You know, did you have this car? Are you like the only owner? She said, yeah. I said, why is there so many miles on it? You've only had it for like four years. She said, well, I'm scared to fly. My kids live in Florida. I live in New oh. Jersey. And she goes, I just did the 100,000 mile warranty on that car. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. Bought the car. Pulled up to the treatment center. Everyone right. was like, oh, this guy's the man, whatever. Right. You know, or like it looks presentable. Correct. I didn't want to be driving like this big truck right. as like a treatment center owner. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of the watch was I, I had to go and do interviews mm -hmm. to promote this new business. And I was doing these interviews. And, I, and the business that I had was that I was representing that I it was high-end luxury. Mm -hmm. So I, how can I say that I have this high-end luxury business mm -hmm. and, you know, not have a fancy a nice watch, watch, yeah, things like that. So mm -hmm. that's something that I learned from my sponsor in the meetings mm -hmm. because a lot of times you don't want to go to a meeting. They say dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually I, I made it. It's interesting because like the thing with like the fake watches, like a lot of people are like, oh, if you wear a fake watch or like, it's like, it's like really frowned upon. There's like people who call people out, but you know, I know like we're close where you would have been like, yeah, like you're proud that it's fake. You know? <laughs> You'd be like, oh, you like this watch? It's not even real. It's not even <laughs> real. You know, yeah. it's not like you're trying to convince me that it's real. So not it, friends. It, yeah. No. This is for the persona that persona. you're creating. Yeah. And um, I think that a lot of people in the social media world don't understand that. Welcome to the Genesis House powered by the United Recovery Project, located in sunny South Florida. We offer drug and alcohol addiction treatment, as well as a major focus on dual diagnosis. Our addiction therapy programs include behavioral therapy, 12-step facilitation, psychotherapy, life skills training, and more. At our facility, you can expect a low client to staff ratio, daily group therapy, weekly one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions, and luxury amenities such as volleyball, basketball, pool, chiropractor, personal trainer, yoga, massage therapy, and more. Contact the United Recovery Project today and let's create a better tomorrow. Those people you see on the internet, you don't know them. Right. People are like, oh, I don't like this person. Like, you, don't, you don't even know who they are. Right, you know? right, right. There are plenty of people that I thought I liked. There's this guy that I used to listen to his podcast all the time. Right. One of the only few podcasts I listen to. I met him and I'm like, I don't really like that guy. Right. I can't even listen to his podcast anymore. You know, oh. I have so much respect for you for what you've accomplished because you might be one of the first people that I like personally knew who became like super successful. Yeah. And still went to meetings. Always. So you've always been somebody who like, I would say 90% of people who I know who got successful kind of forgot about the program. And I, I call it leaving after the miracle. Yeah. You know, we leave before the miracle and then some people leave right after it. Oh, I yeah. got everything I need. I don't need to go here. And I'm not trying to like judge people who do, who do that. Right. I have to commend the people who have and who stuck around to keep carrying the message and be there for other people, you know? Yeah, I'm the arts and graphics chair again this year. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you've done <laughs> so that for years now. <laughs> I gotta stop. Yeah. I gotta stop. You, you just can't ever forget where you come from. Yeah, I just, I just can't ever forget where I came from because I'd have nothing without all the love that was given to me. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy what we can do as addicts. And I kind of did the same thing with my wife, you know, the fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And we made her into someone. Yeah. And Do you want to say who she is? We, I'll just, <laughs> we'll just say that. So she's my, an Instagram personality. Yeah. My okay. wife has a, a, a huge Instagram account and mm -hmm. she didn't have one before. And I, I don't know if it's just that I just have so much in as an, I, I'm just an addict, I guess. You're and, a super creative. 
yeah, there's something that I, I don't know. But so my wife, it was funny because we have we have kids, mm -hmm. which is a blessing in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, we have twins, and she she was an esthetician, and she said, "I want to go back to work, but I don't want to go be an esthetician. I'm going to go to college." And I looked at her, and I'm like, "You're going to go to college?" Okay, mm -hmm. and and we were friends with a girl who had a big social media. She was dating one of my guys, and I said, "We're just going to make you a social media star." And she was like, "What?" Mm. I'm like, "You're pretty, you know, you're hot. Like, let's make you a social media star." And she was like, "Well, I always wanted to do modeling back back in mm -hmm. Colombia." Wow. And so I we went and we took some pictures. I did exactly what I did with my Garen James character. You know, you can buy, mm -hmm. just so everyone knows, like you can buy covers, mm -hmm. magazine covers. Mm -hmm. Most magazine covers that you see today are bought. Wow. Except for like the major ones, so Cosmopolitan. Like you'll, like you'll buy to be on it? Correct. Oh, wow. Okay, so you have like a major one, like let's say the Playboy, mm -hmm. okay? There's Playboy Canada, Australia. Playboy Australia, uh, New Zealand. Yeah, I, was There's talking, Playboy. I was talking to this girl and she said, I'm on the cover of Playboy. And like, I was so happy for her right. as Australia. Correct, which yeah. is is paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean hey, to blow up her spot. Hey, hey yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's not put her out there. <laughs> don't mention her name. That's so awesome. I looked around at di different social media people and I remember I saw a headline and it said, Playboy model, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay. So she's going to be a Playboy model. And I bought her a Playboy cover. It was like $2,500. Mm -hmm. I bought the, like, the shittiest country the that there was, one. the lowest yeah. price one, because there's a list. North Korea. Yeah, it was North Korea. <laughs> so <laughs> so 1500 yeah. bucks. And then mm -hmm. you could get a Maxim, Maxim somewhere. So oh, I cool. did like two or three covers, mm -hmm. right? And then I called up my publicist, and I said, you know, Francie is on, on Playboy. And she was like, oh, really? Let's so she, she called podcast people in New York, mm -hmm. and she went on a DJ Who Kid. Oh, wow, okay. And she got her on there because she's Playboy model. Uh -huh. We just made a character. Mm -hmm. She became, you know, her. She's the character. Mm -hmm. She's a mom at home. So we made this character, yeah. and I've never been on her Instagram. She's not married. She doesn't have kids. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is, Ah, you know, with Instagram and Instagram models, I'm sure people listening follow a few of them on Instagram. They're By girls. accident, they By, just yeah, click just on happened. them. Yeah. So it was funny because I, I noticed that the girls that just took pictures weren't really gaining. And and I just became obsessed. Yeah, you got to do something cool. Obsessed with numbers mm -hmm. and gains and views. And if you're an addict, you become obsessed. Be because a lot of people look at social media like, ah, oh, well, you know, like, a lot of people, if you didn't grow up with social media, right. I know how to post a picture. Right. But you probably know more about Instagram and Facebook and social media and TikTok than anyone I've ever met. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I got obsessed. Yeah. I did all the research. I mm -hmm. There was a guy who had a big page. I actually hired him as a guru. And then I found other wow. people. I, I, I paid this guy 500 a month to be my guru because he knew everything about Instagram. And then I found other people. And then once I learned a little information, then I have a chat group with four other guys that know a lot. And we so just trade new stuff, comes, new stuff okay. this, that, new, new tricks, new tips. And so, but the funny thing is, is that again, that, that creativity, we went to this place because as a influencer, you kind of get invited to places. So we got invited to the Tiger King place. Oh, okay. We got invited to that guy, the Doc Antle. Doc Antle. All okay. right. So we got yeah, invited to Doc Antle's place. And it was free if she made a post. Mm -hmm. So my wife, they get her in this pool with some panthers mm -hmm. and they're holding a cue card. And she has to read, save the animals, blah, blah, blah. And then you tag the place. Mm -hmm. And I said to the owner, Doc, I said, Doc, you know, I don't think that's going to get a lot of views for you. I said, can we do something a little different? And he was like, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, you know, Bubbles the elephant, what if we put a little jelly on her butt mm -hmm. and she's, you know, maybe talking to you and the elephant sniffs her butt or mm -hmm. something? He's like, okay. I said, it's going to get you more views than her, you know, reading talking, a cue card. Yeah. reading a cue card. He's like, okay, let's try it. So we went and put some jelly on, the, on her butt. Mm -hmm. Elephant didn't do anything. And he said, you know, the elephant really likes these mints that I carry. It's kind of a way that I train the mm -hmm. elephant. Do you want to try something else? And I was like, of course. He's like, if you put the 
the the mint in her bra. Mm -hmm. I bet you. Oh, go in there. It'll try to sniff it. He uh -huh. said, "All right." I said, yeah. "I was like, that's brilliant." So we ended up having her walk over to the elephant, mm -hmm. and then f we trained trained the elephant two yeah. or three times. I hope so many people have seen this video. I but, have. I have. Yeah. <laughs> so, but now I'm kind of giving. You know, it's supposed to be not planned. <laughs> anyway, it was totally planned because she walked over, we taught the elephant, and then mm -hmm. once the elephant knew, I said, okay, you ready? Action. You know, it's the f I said, yeah. action. She wow. walks in. She's like, can I get a picture with the elephant? Can I get a picture uh -huh. with the elephant? And then the elephant's doing this, and then she screams, and I go, oh, my God, in the background. Mm -hmm. We posted it on Instagram. That video went on World Star Barstool Sports. Wow. It went on. It went on the David was that Spade the show. The beginning of being viral. <sighs> that was my first taste. Viral what content can, can do. do. Yeah. So that video was in New York Post. Mm. David Spade show played it on um, on on Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. Everyone wrote Playboy model yep. gets um, attacked by an elephant. Power of compounding. And again, oh, little things add those up. Those little yeah. things add up. And then that's a passion of mine because, again, that was starting something from nothing. And we as addicts, mm -hmm. we can start something from nothing. Mm -hmm. Whether you have to create a character or not, whether you have to buy a shovel and start a sprinkler business, eventually get 10 vehicles. Yeah, You know, this is... This is just something you you just have to believe in yourself. The problem with us addicts is that we've done so much damage that we don't, don't believe. believe in mm. ourselves. But if you surround yourself with people that believe in you, people that say nice things to you like you have done to me tonight, you know, these are things that really resonate with me and push me. And mm. my sponsor saying, you know, you can do anything if you're clean. Mm -hmm. This is the type of people, if you surround yourself with enough of these people, you will make things happen in yeah. your life. I hated myself. I truly could not look in the mirror. I was so happy that in jail, the mirror was kind of wavy. Mm. It wasn't a real mirror because I truly couldn't see myself because mm. I hated to look at myself. Me and too. today, I can honestly wake up brush my teeth and smile at myself in the mirror. I love myself today. Once you have that, that love, we can do anything. Yeah, it's like uh, part of being successful is having like this obsessive drive. Yes. And like as addicts, we have that times 10. Times 10. What we don't have is the self-confidence and the belief. And yes. then our addiction uh, ruins everything in the middle of it. Yes. So we start to believe that we can't do anything Correct. because we get high and we never learn the lesson. And we never learned anything. That's why people are 40, 50 years old getting mm -hmm. clean. They're still like these little kids because they're stuck in that cycle of not learning the lesson in, in mm -hmm. life. I just want to talk about what's going on with you now. I know you had like a new show coming out. I was on a Netflix show. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's a crazy story in itself. <laughs> but I just got interviewed for that show, Gunther's Millions. Gunther's Millions? It's about the dog that's a billionaire. It's on Netflix. It's okay. not really about me. Okay. But I was a part of the dog's journey at one point. Okay. There's um, really a dog that's a millionaire? Billi billionaire. Uh, million. No, it's million. Million. Millionaires. Yeah. D Gunther's millions. What does the dog do? The dog bought Madonna's house a long How? time ago. Who's in, who had the dog talks? The dog does not talk. But its owners it's, talk? Well, it's, the dog owns the money. Okay. But he, he, the dog has trustees, trustees that uh -huh. help make decisions for it, but it's all in the interest of the dog's oh, happiness. The dog. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So back in uh, when I was in Milan modeling, mm -hmm. I got a call from a friend that the dog needed someone. And I was, I was clean at this point, but mm -hmm. it was like 27. It was in between some of those treatment mm -hmm. centers. The dog needed someone to go on the Italian talk show mm -hmm. because there was a, a boy band that the dog wanted, so that they created a boy band. Mm -hmm. But my friend couldn't make it to, to Italy, so I went on as pretend member of this group. Okay, and It was so funny because they said, we're going on a talk show, and I was like, 
I don't speak Italian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like what could I say? <laughs> They're like, just hold the dog. Wow. And we'll do the talking, but maybe say like, they gave me a sentence to say <laughs> at some point in Italian. I forget what the sentence mm-hmm. was, but I went on like uh, the equivalent of- Like Letterman? N- n- uh, Oprah Winfrey. Wow. It was the largest talk show in Italy. It mm-hmm. was like an Oprah Winfrey mm-hmm. there. And I ended up sitting down with the dog and smiling in my little boy band uh-huh. outfit, holding the dog as a big German shepherd, mm-hmm. just smiling. Uh, so, I mean, I got interviewed as part of that whole story on the Gunther's Millions. But it's not my my show, but it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a great show to watch on Netflix for sure. It was also interesting to see uh, the whole Jigula show blow up. Yeah, that it was, was good. It was pretty popular for a while. It was good, yeah. How many seasons did it run? Six, six seasons. Wow, six seasons. That's, yeah. that's not easy to do in TV. No. That's crazy. That show was crazy because, again, I faked it till I made it. Mm-hmm. I went on the Tyra Banks show and I pretended that I had, you know, I went on with, the, with the watch mm-hmm. and agency. And, and so then I got a call from the producers of, of Showtime. It was so funny. They're like, well... We need the guys and the clients. Do you have them? I said, of course I have them. Yeah. <laughs> Hung up the phone you're like, <laughs> what do I do? Uh-huh. You know, I ended up, it was pr- it's pretty, uh, I guess I can say it. What I did was, is I ended up going on Arrows. First mm-hmm. of all, I had to find and make my site real. So mm-hmm. I went on Model Mayhem. I ended up contacting guys. Hey, I have this, you know, companion agency. Would you like to be one? And built up the men for sure. Mm-hmm. But then the, yeah, the clients slowly came. Prior to this, it's like a myth. It's oh, for, it's a myth. For people that don't know, it's like uh, Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo. Right. Like that exact thing in real life. It's like, on what planet are women hiring male companions? Right. So, but the funny thing was, is we started to really get clients. Mm-hmm. But to convince a client to go on TV show, like a woman, yeah. successful woman. To say that she, no. she's paying what, companions no. never. Wouldn't happen. I wanted the show to happen. And and I ended up going on different things like Eros and mm-hmm. things like that. And I would say, hey, we have a TV show. Would you pretend? To be a client. To be a client. They're paying like 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. And she was like, okay. And I'd say, all right, I'm going to have the producer call you. Mm-hmm. But remember, you're a client of the agency. Mm. That's all you got to say. So that first season was me pulling strings to make it happen. To make it happen. Yeah. Wow. Now, then they had proof of concept. Yes. It worked. The producers didn't know. Wow. They didn't know that they weren't real clients. They thought they were real clients. Wow. So, but then what happened was, is the show, the first season was so good. I ended up putting a little MailChimp on my website, mm-hmm. do you want to be on the Gigolo show? Because I knew my real clients yeah. really wouldn't want to be on yeah. it. So but someone else might. I had a mailing list because then they became fans of the of the guys of the and really show. just wanted yeah. to meet the guys. Of course. So I had a mailing list and people would put their email in and mm-hmm. then I didn't know if it was going to be another season or not, but I was going to be prepared. And so <laughs> when the next, when they announced we're going to have another season, Garen, we need the clients. Mm-hmm. I just did an email blast. Hell yeah. <laughs> and I go. had 20 clients for them. They're like, you're you're the man. Mm-hmm. And I really love that show because I could give concept ideas. I mean, it's a reality show. I don't know if you guys know this or not. It's staged. Reality shows are not real. Mm-hmm. They're not real. Um, they're in the sense that reality shows have a theme. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that part's usually not real. But what happens during that scene is real. Mm-hmm. But you do get some guideline of what you're supposed to do. Yeah, like when you watch like the real world, right? You know, I'm sure it's more than them just sitting in the house watching TV because no. no one would watch that. Correct. So they have to create yeah. drama. You're right. If it's not automatically happening. Yeah. Right. So yeah, creative consultant, which I was on that show, was what's funny. Mm-hmm. What's this? All right. Uh, you That's know. That's another thing you do because a lot of girls that are Instagram models online. They're yeah. not funny. They're not yeah. funny. They're not doing anything different. They're not yeah. like you guys are funny. You guys yeah, are thanks. funny. You guys are interesting. You guys do stuff with like Supreme Patty and like yeah. all these other like people. And it's like uh, you guys are not in a in a box. Yeah, I love that. Oh, so so yeah, the reality show. Yeah, I want to. I'll go back to that mm-hmm. because I love. I still love talking about my wife more than anything else. Mm. But but the reality TV show is like was just so much fun to do. And it really 
again, I faked my way onto that and it really made my business very successful mm -hmm. because part of my contract was I wanted my agency name to be said. In every show. Not, awesome. it was like every, it was like at least half the episodes. Okay. Yeah. The name. So how the agency? Uh, yes. Cowboys yeah. for Angels? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll yeah. say it. Yeah. And it was so funny too, back to like, I always wanted to be an actor or whatever, this and that. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just never happened for me, but I ended up, having my uh, my own show yeah you know mm -hmm. that was it was like just the way the universe works is amazing but yeah going back to social media we do a lot of cringe content mm. which girls just can't post I, girls can't post I've cringe. Had girls be like you know my social media sucks da, da, da. i'm like dude this girl just dressed up as an alien <laughs> and walked through fucking aventura mall <laughs> yes. i'm not doing that exactly okay well, okay, go take the same picture everyone else does. I yeah. don't know what else to tell you, but yeah. it's like I really commend you guys because it's like not everybody can do that. And like I know you guys like outside of that. Yeah. And you guys are so normal. So, so normal. So it's like you guys are so normal. My wife is so normal. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. I could imagine that when she does it, it's almost as if like Somebody who like like my friend Carl has kids. Right. Carl's a tough guy. Yeah. But he's able to dress up like the Ninja Turtles right. and play with his kids for two hours. Yes. And he will I love Carl. Hey, thank you. I love yeah. him too. But and he will sing like Disney songs or whatever. And it's almost kind of like that. Where like when I see it online, I'm always yeah. like, wow, that's so cool how she can she can do that. Right. But I'm sure in her head she's like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> oh no, my wife. Oh, the first time I had an idea, I mm -hmm. said, let's have you get on the bus. A and city bus. I know when you guys do the city bus city stuff, bus. it's crazy. Let's have you get on yeah. the bus in lingerie like you're on your way to work, but don't say where you're going to work mm -hmm. and just like everyone will, you know, think, oh, and then the caption is like, where do I work? <laughs> right? Because then the comments drive the, yeah, the yeah. post the and, and obviously people are going to say strip club or they'll say something funny mm -hmm. like the library or mm -hmm. whatever. And my wife, she was in a trench coat in the lingerie. Sitting at the bus station, Broward County bus station. It's like, like the most dangerous place in Broward County. <laughs> she was like this. Um, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm like, baby, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm not doing it. You have no idea. It's because it's so funny because some of the comments are like, you're, you just want attention. You want this. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. She doesn't want any of that. I want the views. You know, yeah. I want the, you know, that's. Yeah, people don't say, I'm building a business. Right. Like, this isn't, like, I'm not, like, trying to... Get attention. Get attention That's or whatever. A business, like, a brand. I'm, yeah, I'm building a business. And I think uh, think in a couple of years, you guys had million, multiple millions of followers. Yeah, yeah we got up to 11.6 now. Yeah. Which is insane. 11.6 Yeah, she's crazy. She has the 1,123rd largest... Instagram account out of the billion of users. So we're almost top in the 1, top. 1,000. Yeah, we're almost in the top. 1,100. 1,100, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're almost in the top 1,000. But again, mm -hmm. this is, again, a create a character we created. And I just want to say that um, a lot of times people look at successful people and they're like, oh, well, you know, I see how much you guys work. Yeah. I've hung out with you guys and seen like, <laughs> like it's, it's just nonstop. Like you, like there's so much work that goes into it. Like every reply to every, sometimes yeah. I look at it, I'm just like, this is insane. Because right. I've seen you guys replying to every single comment and, right. and the messages. And it's like, you guys have done such an amazing job with it and made it so fun. Like, yeah. it's, it's really cool to see it. I love it. It's my own little personal TV show and my wife is my muse. Yeah. I love her to death. Mm -hmm. and she's my muse. And again, I just use that, that drive of mm -hmm. addiction. If I'm clean and I focus that, I got obsessed with growing an Instagram account. Mm -hmm. And I got obsessed with making Cowboys for Angels. Mm -hmm. And I used, I've done these major press pieces. I did a full hour on Dr. Phil. Yeah. I did a full I did a full episode with Juju Chang on mm. Nightline News in 2020. And you know that I'm shitting my pants <laughs> prior to the episodes. I went on Tyra Banks full episode. But you know what? What I would do is, is I would prepare. Whatever your job is, if you're prepared, yeah. like whatever it is. But for me, I was, I'm literally going on Dr. Phil. Like, and it's a lot, it, they film it yeah. live. There's no wow. like, 
Can you cut? I mean, it doesn't. It's not aired live, just in case someone says some bad words. But you're not going to be. It's filmed. You're not telling them what to put. No, you can't say like, um, can you can you guys cut? Mm -hmm. You know, can can you cut that out? You know, for something like Doctor Phil, I remember I watched many episodes. Like I went on YouTube and I just watched episodes. And I ended up seeing how he interviews. Correct. And I wrote down questions I thought he may ask. You're a reverse engineer. You know that? You, you <laughs> did it with the prescription pads. You yes, did it with everything. Dr. Phil. I remember I wrote down mm-hmm. about 25 questions that I thought he might ask. Mm. And I wrote a paragraph for each one and edited each one until it was just this amazing answer. Mm. Amazing answer that sold my brand. Mm. And then I would go in front of the mirror for, I think I, it was like for 10 days. And I would mm-hmm. spend two hours a day standing in front of the mirror. And I'd ask myself the question until I had it down fire. Like there's no me like earlier saying, yeah. what was that damn magazine article? Yeah, you had it all. I had it just on fire. And when I went on Dr. Phil, the question would come and I'd be like, yes, I knew he would ask that mm. question and just boom, fired off and smile and, mm-hmm. you know, fake watch yeah. and all and mm-hmm. suit and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, this is actually believing in myself mm. again from the love of people in the program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, like watching you stick around and do all this service and like all the success you've had, because sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. <laughs> Not to say that like I'm so special, but like sometimes I go to meetings and I, I, you know, I see other people, but I don't see too many people with like 10 plus years clean making the coffee, you yeah. know, or like, you know, excited about the next convention. I have friends with years clean that are successful and I'll be like, hey, you going to the spiritual retreat? And they'll be like, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, <laughs> like a joke. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm serious, yeah. you know? Which is coming up this year. I know you used to be a fan of it. Are you going? I went last year. Where are you talking? No, no, the, the keys. Oh, the keys. Oh, the the one. They're doing it in the keys now. Remember, they didn't do it for like seven years. Oh, the, well, it's the sugar loaf. Sugar. Well, no, it's a different campsite now. Are you going? Yeah, April twenty seventh. You gotta go. I might come. Yeah, with my kids. Yeah, you should. Yeah, bring well, my kids. And I, I do want to say that I know you personally, and out of all the things you do, seeing how much of a committed dad you are. <laughs> Is by far the coolest thing. Yeah. And your wife, because yeah. I see you guys in the, I see the minivan outside, you know, yeah. <laughs> I see you guys like going on these BMX trips. You're like the coolest parent. Well, you, you know, also, I mean, the job that I have is it's on a cell phone. It so why can't I, you know, I go pick up my kid school and hang out and mm-hmm. I don't know. I just want to be a good, good dad. I really yeah, do. You guys are. Yeah. Amazing parents. But, you know, talking about the minivan, that's so funny because <laughs> I could drive a Lambo. I choose a minivan. You know, my wife has a Range Rover, mm-hmm. and if I go to the 7 Eleven, I'm jumping in the minivan. Mm-hmm. To me, the minivan is like, it's like being in a lazy boy mm-hmm. or an office chair. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think the Range Rover is like being yeah. in an office chair. But the minivan just represents to me like my family. Yeah. And that's what's the most important thing. And I don't know, I I love a minivan. The one problem, the one time I got a little upset was I was going down to South Beach picking up a friend. Okay. And it was actually someone with a huge Instagram. It's like, so, Mm -hmm. you know, and my wife has a huge Instagram and I was on the gigolo shows after all of that. Mm -hmm. And I pulled into the valet and the guy's like, rolls down the window and he's like, are are you Uber? I'm like, no, I'm fucking Garen James, man. Wow. Like, no. <laughs> you know, he thought I was an Uber driver. I'm in a minivan. You know, that was the only time that I was like, you know, fuck Maybe I you. should get the Lambo. Maybe I need a Lambo. No, has but- anybody ever said anything like, oh, like, why do you have, has anyone ever said anything like that? Uh, what? Like, why do you have- About the minivan? My wife, when we go out- Might think something. <laughs> no, she, we have to drive the Range Rover. Rover. Yeah, we have oh, to. So funny. She won't let us go down to South Beach in my mini. I have a Prius, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember I like was going on a date with this girl, and she was pretty Instagram famous. Yeah. I, you know, I was gonna like you know take her in the luxury car, and I'm like, you know, what? I'm just gonna pick her up in the Prius. Picked her up in the Prius. Never said a word. Didn't care about the car. Didn't ask why I had a Prius. Right. She was just like, hey, what's up? Good to see you. Like she didn't even. It, it was cool to do that. Uh, yeah, that's it good. was cool. Yeah, because. But like sometimes when you drive a luxury car, it doesn't feel comfortable because you're like, 
you're thinking about the miles. You're thinking oh. about curbing a wheel. And like, you know, you don't want to spill something. Dude, yeah. that Prius, I, like, sl- <laughs> I hit my mailbox and dented the whole side. I was like, whatever. Well, that, you, know? Yeah. you know, back when, when I met you, Brian, mm-hmm. that, that Maserati wasn't mine. Um, that was a girl that I was dating. That first time that I met you, that wasn't my Maserati. Mm-hmm. You know, when I finally started that business and bought my first like car, it was a, it was a Range Rover. Mm-hmm. It was used. Okay. It was used, but I bought a Range Rover. And I remember the lesson that I learned was I was having a bad day. Something had happened and I had to, I went in the car to go somewhere and I was having a bad day. And I said to myself, you're in a Range Rover. You shouldn't be having a bad day. Mm. And that didn't fix my bad day. And at that point I knew that a luxury car, a nice watch, a nice condo, mm-hmm. none of that matters. It feels so good when you get it, and then you show a couple people, and they say, congrats, yeah. and then the next day, it's your car. It just takes you to wherever you need to go. Where like, you need to go. Like, the next day, it's it's just one. It's just the car. That right. It's like... But you have some cool cars. That's different. Yeah, I have some cool cars, but I love cars. I'm obsessed yeah. with cars. You're a car guy. I make money on most of my cars. Right. What turns me on about a car is, like... Well, you could buy it at this year, and if it has this many miles, and then you go, you sell yeah. it and make more money on right. it. Like I'm, I like the like. I'm not just hey, give me the sticker price, you right. know. Like, you know, if you buy a Ferrari and you pre-order it two years from now, you could drive it for a year and still sell it for what you bought it for. To me, like that's interesting. Yeah, not necessarily like oh, I bought a. Right, uh, you Bentley don't do it for, and, and I lost seventy thousand dollars on it in six months. You're like, <laughs> you know, I, to I know me, you. Yeah. yeah, you're you're not uh, you don't buy the car out of ego. You buy the car because you you love it, and yeah, um, you like to flip it and make flip it. You I know, make a money. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's like to me, like I like the deal. Yeah, I like wheeling and deal. <laughs> it's so funny because a lot of times I, I follow you on Instagram, mm-hmm. and a lot of times you're most like. I guess expensive things uh-huh. are for close friends only. Yeah, it's yeah. Funny. My close, which my, I like. My close, yeah. You're on my close friends. Yeah. My close friends Instagram is like a whole another persona, you know. And it's like you know what? When I became a CEO of a treatment center, I had to create the CEO of a treatment center. Right. Not that I'm a fake or anything like that, but hey, posting memes right. isn't really professional. Right. Hey, I used to have a meme Instagram. I had to delete it. Right. You know, I, I want I want to be taken seriously. I employ doctors. Right. I employ nurses. So, you know, a lot of times, sometimes I would feel like I was living like a, not like a double life, but like I couldn't be myself. And I just realized that in a professional setting, some things just aren't appropriate. Right. And I want, and because I was so young, I was scared that people weren't right. going to take me seriously. So I wanted to be like over the top professional. Correct. Man, I've had like employees that work for me and they're like, you know, do you ever crack a smile? And I'm just like, you have no idea. You know, <laughs> but like, like they don't know me. They just see me briefly or something like right. that. And it's like, um, sometimes I can be very serious. Yeah. You know, so hey, I want to thank you for coming. I love you so much. It's always good to see you. Brian. I just want to say you drove an hour to be here. You're going to drive an hour home. That means so much to me. <laughs> I know you're a busy guy. Thank you. All right. Thank hey. you for having me, Brian. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 833-999-1877 to speak to a specialist. This show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com.